No one that I know wants his acquaintances to make fun of him or to ridicule his faith and practices. We don't want men and women to assault us for our faith in Christ and our obedience to his will. Yet, that was precisely what occurred in the early days of the church's existence. Christians were often driven from their homes and sometimes even from their home countries. They were imprisoned for being enemies of the state. In ancient Rome, they were put in an arena where they were killed and devoured by lions. We read in Hebrews 11, verses 37 and 38, They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. But when we are persecuted and oppressed, how should we react? Well, our example is Jesus Christ, who suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. He did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, verses 21 and 22. But then I want you to take note of the very next verse, where Peter says, Who, that is, referring to Christ, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Christians in every age should react in the same way that our Lord did. He did not retaliate for the wrongs which were done to him, and neither should we. When Christ was reviled, he did not respond by reviling back. The word revile is also translated as railed at, and oftentimes it means to abuse someone verbally. Well, the imperfect tense of this word suggests that Christ constantly suffered from being reviled. People were constantly critical of him and abusing him verbally. But when he was reviled, he continued not reviling or speaking abusively of those who were mistreating him. In other words, his constant response to being reviled was not to revile again. Well, the tense of the verb suggests that not responding in kind, this was habitual for Jesus. He made it a habit of not taking vengeance upon those who abused him. When he suffered from the bitter attacks of his enemies, he didn't threaten. And again, the tenses of the verb suffered and threatened are imperfect, and they denote continual suffering one time after another. But regardless of the suffering inflicted by Christ's enemies, Jesus continually refused to threaten his persecutors. He had the power to call to his aid 10,000 angels, but he would not do it. His submission to the will of God obligated him to bear his burdens without reviling or without threatening. In the face of such pressures and abuse, Christ committed himself to him who judges righteously. And the word committed means to give oneself over. And the tense of the verb says Christ kept on giving himself over to the one who judges righteously. Now, if you're tempted to think, but Christ was God and could not feel the heartaches and the sorrows that we feel, then friend, you're mistaken. Christ's humanity When he was struck on the face or spat upon, he felt the same pain and shame that we would feel under similar circumstances. When he was ridiculed and reviled, he hurt just as we do, but he knew the will of God completely and determined to do that will regardless of the cost in humiliation and anguish. Nothing his enemies could do would make him behave in any other way than what God desired of him. Friends, Jesus' mission on earth was to bring God to man and man to God. He did not respond to his persecutors by just wiping them off the face of the earth, which certainly he could have done. Instead, he knew that a final day would come when all men, both the righteous and the unrighteous, would give an account of their behavior. So Jesus continually committed himself to God Almighty because he knew that God would judge righteously. Friends, what a great example that we have in Jesus Christ. Friends, we want to thank you for joining us for our program today, and have a blessed day.